with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. Before I start the short talk of this full session in the series of Ramadan and Dr. Zakir, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions, you're most welcome to write them on any of the social media platforms, including Facebook and YouTube. But if you write on the WhatsApp, there are chances it would be because we're going to pick up more than two thirds, 70 to 75 percent of the questions from the WhatsApp. So preferably, you can text your questions in brief with mentioning your name, the city and country of residence to the WhatsApp number plus 60 I repeat, the number plus 60 Double one two six nine five three eight nine five. The topic of this fourth session's short talk is objectives of fasting. And inshallah, I will try and limit this talk to less than ten minutes so that we have more time for the question answer session. I will be enumerating. There are many objectives of fasting. I'll be, enumerating, I'll be enumerating the 16 most important objectives of fasting. Number one is to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, the only act which is done solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else, it is fasting. So we fast for seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, for acquiring taqwa. I quoted the verse of the Quran. Of Surah Bakra, chapter number two, verse number eighty-three, in the starting of my talk, we say that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you, so that you may learn self-restraint. La lakum tatkoon, so that you may learn self-restraint, you may learn God consciousness, piety, righteousness. You come closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. The third objective is to enter Jannah and a blurred prophet said there are eight gates through which you can enter Jannah and if you fast there are chances you'll enter through the gate of Rayyan. The fourth objective is to expiate our sins and a beloved prophet Muhammad said let's mention it's Sahih Bukhari one number three hadith number 1901 that if a person fasts with sincere faith and expecting a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan, all his past sins will be forgiven. The fifth is seeking the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as was mentioned in the previous hadith. And the sixth is seeking forgiveness. Ramadan is also called the month of forgiveness. And Allah forgives the people who fast. So fasting is a way of having your sins forgiven. Number seven is seeking shafa. That is intercession. Fasting will intercede on the day of judgment on your behalf. And the fast will say that this person, he sacrificed the food and drink for me. So there will be intercession by fasting. Eighth is knowing the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By fasting, we come to know the various niyama Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and it makes you appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much better and gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ninth is to increase the willpower by fasting your willpower and determination increases to increase the good deeds. When you fast, you see that you do more good deeds. The fasting increases your good deeds. Eleven, it increases the honesty. Number twelve, it increases the control of your desires. 
And the psychologists they tell us today that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. Thirteenth objective of fasting is to restrict the pathway of the Satan. When you fast, the Satan has less control over you. You restrict the pathway of the Satan. Fourteenth, fasting acts as a shield against the evil. And the prophet said fasting is a shield. So when you fast, it shields you against the evil. The fifteenth is, it abstains. It helps you to abstain from false action. When you fast, you are careful that you are away from the false action and the haram. So it, it helps you to abstain from the false action. And the last main objective of fasting is it abstains from false speech. It abstains you from lying and from doing, from saying things with the haram. This was in brief regarding the main objectives of fasting. For more details, you can refer to my episode on objectives of fasting in my series of Ramadan, a date Dr. Zakir. Alhamdulillah, I was able to complete in less than 10 minutes the main objectives. Before we start the open question session, I would like to inform the viewers that Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, I was pleased and overwhelmed by the response that I'm receiving on the social media. I've been more on the satellite and I'm aware that the satellite has a large reach, mashallah, millions of people watch. But this is the first time that I am going on my own social media life. And alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, in the last three sessions alone, during the live three sessions, more than two million people watched it live on the Facebook. And within a few days, within one week, the number doubled and all the three viewers put together now is more than four million only on the Facebook. And there are hundreds of thousands on the YouTube and thousands on the Instagram and on the Twitter, Alhamdulillah. And I would like to thank all the people who have given wonderful messages on the social media. I would like to say Walaikum Salaam to all of you. I would like to say Ameen and may Allah reward you for all, all your good deeds. And the number of praises I got, I don't think I deserve all that. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he not hold me responsible for what praises they have done about me. And may he forgive them for the negative point that they don't know about me. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me better than what they think about me. As far as the questions are concerned, only on the WhatsApp, Alhamdulillah, by the end of the third last session, Alhamdulillah, we received more than 12,000 questions in all the three sessions put together and the days in between. On the Facebook alone, MashaAllah, we received about more than 65,000 questions and several thousand even on the YouTube, etc. All put together, MashaAllah, about more than 80,000 questions and we have only been able to answer less than 60 in the last three sessions but we'll try and answer as much as we can in this session maybe more than the previous sessions and I would like to remind you that those of you whose questions are not answered be prepared that you may receive a call from me and today morning I made a call to a brother by the name of Helal from Canada and he was shocked to receive my call on the whatsapp it was a video call so i could see him and he could see me and and i'd like to thank him for all the duas that he that he made for me may allah accept it so if your question is not answered be prepared that you may receive a call from me every after every session the same day or the next day before the next session comes inshallah i'll at least make one call to one of the person whose questions have not been answered before we start the question answer session, I would like to remind you, you can ask questions on any of the social media, but preferably on the WhatsApp. Please text your question in brief, mentioning your name, the city and country of residence to the WhatsApp number plus 
53895. I repeat, plus 60-11-269-53895. And now, we take the first question. The first question is, the person says, Vanakam. Vanakam is the Tamil word which means hello and I say hello to you too. Uh, I believe the person is a Tamil who is asking the question and he writes, Vasant here, I am a Hindu residing in Bahrain. I am reading and getting knowledge about Islam for some time but slowly day by day. Can you please tell top five aspects of Islam which can inspire non-Muslims apart from the five pillars as I'm aware of them. Basically, the brother wants to know the top five points that inspire non-Muslim to become Muslim, get them closer to Islam, besides the five pillars. And let me tell you that the major points that inspire a non-Muslim toward Islam are the five pillars. I'll briefly mention some of the points of the five pillars and then come on to the other five important points besides the five pillars. According to me, the number one point that inspires non-Muslims toward Islam is Tawheed. It is oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the concept of God in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is unique unlike other religions. The concept that there is only one God. And that we worship no one else besides Him alone. And He is the all-powerful. He doesn't have any associates. He doesn't have any partners. This concept of Tawheed not merely monotheism, Tawheed, that you worship him alone and no one else, it really impresses a non-Muslim. And the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given in brief in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul Allahu ahd. Say, he is Allah one and only. Allahu samad. Allah, the absolute eternal. Lam yilad wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakullahu kuffanat. And there is nothing like him. This Surah Ikhlas, in short, is the touchstone of theology, giving the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in brief. And it makes it completely different than the other concepts of God, whereas if you see in other religions, God can be defeated, God has got son, God has got wife, the wife gets abducted, the God can be killed. So all these are not the true concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one is Tawheed. Number two, it is the second pillar of Islam, that is Salah. That when a person offers Salah, he gets closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is better than any meditation. It gets you peace of mind. It gets you serenity. And it demonstrates the best example of universal brotherhood. And when the Muslim men, when we stand for Salah in congregation, we stand shoulder to shoulder and feet to feet. Irrespective of whether the person next to you is a king or a pauper, whether he's black or white, we stand shoulder to shoulder. It demonstrates the best example of universal brotherhood five times every day. I'm just mentioning some of the salient features of all the five pillars which attracts a non-Muslim. Number three, it is a zakat. That every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, should give 2.5% as zakat, as obligatory charity, to the eight categories, the poor, the masakin, etc. And here the people feel the closeness. And, and as Allah says in Surah Hashar chapter 59 verse number 7, Zakat prevents the wealth from circulating only amongst the rich. It gets a closeness between the rich and the poor. So this aspect attracts a non-Muslim. The fourth pillar is fasting, it is Som. And we mentioned all the objectives of fasting. All these objectives gets a person closer to Islam. The fifth pillar is Hajj, a pilgrimage. Anyone who has the means and the health and the wealth to perform Hajj should do it once in his lifetime. And Hajj is the best exam example of annual universal brotherhood, where more than 4 million people from all over the world, from different parts of the world, from from Saudi Arabia, from India, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from UK, from USA, from Singapore, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, they gather 
and the men they're dressed up in two pieces of white cloth unsewn. It's and they only come and say labbeik alama labbeik. Here we come at the service of the Lord. So this shows the universal brotherhood. It shows the equality of all the human beings, all dressed up in two pieces of white unsewn cloth. This demonstration of brotherhood impresses a non-Muslim. This was just in brief about some of the salient features. We can give a talk for several hours in reply to this question. The important points that attracts a non-Muslim towards Islam. Now coming to the main question, what are the five top important points beside the five pillars which attracts a non-Muslim towards Islam? Number one beside the five pillars according to me, it is the Quran. The glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The Quran is the ultimate miracle. It's a miracle of miracle. And anyone who reads the Quran, even the translation, if it's a good translation, it brings tears to it his eyes. He realizes the beauty of life. He realizes the purpose of creation. He understands Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He understands the deen. Only giving the translation, a good translation of the glorious Quran to a non-Muslim, it will do wonders. It is one of the major factors beside the five pillar which attracts a non-Muslim towards Islam. It's unlike any other book in the world, unlike any other religious scripture. Number two, besides the five pillar, it is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And according to Michael H. Hart, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi in his book of 100 most influential people in the world, from Adam peace be upon him till today, number one he places being a non-Muslim is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi If you read the seerah of the Prophet, as the Quran rightly says in Surah Qalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, that thou art standeth on the highest standard of character. That means, the character of the Prophet is so superior, it is the best standard. And Allah repeated the message in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 21, that verily in the messenger of Allah, in Prophet Muhammad you will find the most beautiful pattern of conduct. His conduct, his lifestyle, his behavior was an example so much so that even his enemies could not deny calling him the Alameen, the trustworthy, the honest person, they respected him. So if you read the seerah of the Prophet, there are high chances that if a non-Muslim reads with an unbiased mind, though there are thousands of books written against the Prophet, but if you read the seerah, you will find that he was the best example, best exemplary human being that Allah has sent on the face of the earth. Number three, top reason besides the five pillars that a non-Muslim accepts Islam, and gets attracted is the concept of life after death that is believing there is life after death because when you look around us there is so much of wrong happening there's so much of criminals so much of injustice being done and you wonder how is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing this injustice is he not capable of stopping it Allah gives the reply in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse number 185 that every soul shall have a taste of death and the final recompense will be on the day of judgment and this life is a mere amusement if you enter jannah you have achieved the objective of this life because this life is just mere tools of deception so here we know that the final recompense is on the day of judgment imagine if you have to think of hitler the person who we know who has killed the maximum number of human beings in the world History tells us 6 million. Even if you catch Hitler today, what punishment can you give him? Maybe death, that will compensate for one. What about the remaining 5,999,999 human beings they have killed? The only reply to this is, Allah will give him the final punishment in the day of judgment. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 56, that as to those who reject our signs, we will cast them into the hellfire. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. That means in the next life, and today we have come to know that the feeling of pain is responsible. It's based on the pain receptors which are present in the skin. So if your skin is burnt and the pain receptors are destroyed, you cannot feel the pain. And that's what happened in this life. A person has a 100% burn injury and his pain receptors have been destroyed, you cannot feel pain. 
But on the day of judgment, Allah says, as often as your skins are roasted, we shall give you fresh skin so that you shall feel the pain. That means if Allah wants to incinerate, burn Hitler 6 million times, 10 million times, 12 million times, we can do it. We can't give him such a punishment in this life. So there has to be a life after death for justice in this world. And the fifth, and the fourth point that attracts a person beside the five pillars of Islam is that this life that we are leading is a test for the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah has created death and life to test which of you is best indeed. This life is a test for us for the hereafter. Many of the questions that we ask that how are millions of people dying of hunger? There's so much of poverty. Can't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them food? Can't Almighty God? There are so many people dying in, in diseases. They're dying in earthquakes. What is the reason? The reason is this life is a test for the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests different people with different things. Some people he tests with wealth, some people with poverty, some people with health, some people with diseases. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155, that do you, do you think Allah will not test you? And I'll, before you go to Jannah, Allah has to test you. Allah says, we will test you with hunger or with fear of life. Or with the property that we have acquired. Allah will test you in different ways. And the fifth reason that attacks a person besides the five pillar, it is the repentance. That the concept of repentance of Tawbah in Islam, that irrespective of however many sins you do, you may do a sin as big as the mountain touching the sky. You may sin the whole day, whole night. But if you truly repent, and you ask forgiveness in Islam, Allah will forgive any sin, even if you have done the worst of the sin. So this gives a hope to a human being that now he is bad and now he reads the book, he knows about religion. So can he turn into a new leaf? Very well he can. He may be the worst human being in the world. If he sincerely repents and he asks for forgiveness, he does toba. Inshallah, Allah will forgive him. And the beauty of Islam is if a person was a non-Muslim, the big sin he does and after he repents, the bigger the sin he leaves, the bigger reward he gets. So imagine if a person is the biggest sinner and he thinks, okay, now if I accept Islam, all my sins will get converted to the good deeds. MashaAllah. So these are the five points that I can think at the top in priority besides the five pillars of Islam. So hope this answer, it's a very brief answer. You can speak for hours on this. But because it's a question answer session, I don't want to spend more time. Because there was a non-Muslim asking a question, I gave a reply in more detail. There are many messages I'm receiving on, on the Facebook. There are from Sujan Sarkar, Assalamu Alaikum. From Abu Hanifa, I love Allah, I love Muhammad, I love them too. Uh, may Allah bless you, Reban Begum, Maruf Ahmed, God bless you, sir. Suyud Rasi, I'm from Bangladesh. Saad Talat, love and respect to a great scholar of our time. Hassan Mahmood, Salaamu Alaikum. Imran Khan, from Bangladesh. We have Rumi Arshad, Assalamu Alaikum from Calcutta. Wa Alaikum Assalam, Alhamdulillah Barakatuh. I'm not reading the questions. And Ali Muhammad Qadir, Assalamu Alaikum. Care, care, Rumi Arshad. To all of them, Assalamu Alaikum, Alhamdulillah Barakatuh. Wa Alaikum Assalam, Alhamdulillah Barakatuh. And thank you for your duas. May Allah reward you. And may Allah, Inshallah, let us enter Jannah together and we meet there, Inshallah. The second question that has come on the WhatsApp which has been selected by my team from thousands of questions that have come and are yet coming. Azra Khan from Pakistan. If a woman has kept fast and she starts to menstruate just a few moments before Maghrib, will her fast be nullified? And one of the fast breakers for a woman is menstruation. If a lady menstruates, the fast breaks. If she is menstruating, she cannot keep a fast. Yeah. While she is fasting, even if she menstruates a few minutes, so even a minute before the Maghrib time, 
then a fast is nullified. But but naturally she can very well keep the fast late after Ramadan when she is healthier, and she gets the equal sawab what she gets for a Muslim fasting in the month of Ramadan. The third question, Assalamu alaikum, Sultan Salahuddin, place Chennai, India. My question, is it permissible for an asthmatic patient to use inhaler while fasting? If a person is suffering from asthma and if he uses the puffer or the inhaler, there is an unanimous agreement between all the fuqahs and all the scholars that it does not break your fast. Because when you use an inhaler or a puffer, there is a compressed air which, which you put into your mouth. It goes to your throat and from the throat, it enters into your lungs. It does not enter into your stomach. So because of that, your fast is not broken. Even if you use a mask having oxygen in the situation of asthma and you breathe, that too does not break the fast because it doesn't enter your stomach. It mainly goes to your lung. But there are certain treatments in asthma. For example, vaporizers, vaporizers, you know, where there may be some medicine put and there's pressure of air. And if that medicine goes while going into your lung, there are chances that some portion may go into your stomach. Or suppose the capsule is put into an equipment with compressed air and this capsule is mainly containing powder. So there are high chances that the powder can mix into your saliva and from that it can go into your stomach. So because there are chances in such type of tablets, or, 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 or capsules or vaporizers, this sort of treatment for asthma, it is preferable to do it before the time of fast starts or after it ends. If it's a must that you have to take it in between, then most welcome, you can break your fast and keep it afterwards, after Ramadan. Or if you have to take it throughout your life, then what you can do is you can feed one poor person for every fast you have missed. Hope that answers the question. There's a question by Faizan, Kuwait. My question is, will we get the same sawab of reading Quran, whether we read in English or Arabic, since I cannot read Arabic fluently? As far, I mean, a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, that every letter you recite of the Quran, you get sawab. And Allah is not one letter. It is Alif is a letter, Lam is a letter, Ha is a letter. You get ten 10, 10 hasnat, 10 sawab. So for every letter you recite of the Quran, you get 10 blessings. As far as this blessing is concerned, surely it's only when you recite the, the Quran in Arabic, not when you read the translation. But natural, when you read the translation, you'll get sawab, but not the same at all as you get in Arabic. The sawab that you get for reading the translation in Arabic is multiple times more than reading the translation. But the point to be noted is that one is sawab for reading the Quran, the other is sawab for implementing the Quran. If you read Arabic and you don't understand Arabic, how can you implement on the message of the Quran? Whereas if you read in English or Urdu or Bangla, the language you understand the best, you may get a minute or small percentage of sawab for reading it. But if you implement on the message, you will get multiple times more sawab. So reading sawab is one thing in which you get more in Arabic, but implementing is one thing. If you read the Quran in translation and you implement on the message, implement on the message that you abstain from the things which are haram and do the things which are commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, surely the sawab is multiple times more even than reading in Arabic. So the best I would say is that if you don't understand Arabic as a language, the best is you read the Arabic Quran in Arabic and also read the translation. It is the best. You're killing two birds with one stone so that you get the sawab for reading also and you also get the sawab for implementing the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is another question that is asked on the Facebook that just came a couple of minutes before. It is from Always Ahmed Parai from Kashmir, India, which takes priority, calling non-Muslims to Islam or calling non-committed Muslims to become religious committed Muslims. The brother asking that which is more priority, Dawa, that is inviting non-Muslims to Islam, or Isla, that is correcting the Muslims which are making mistake. 
actually both are important but if you ask that you have less time and you can do only one of the two then my reply is that if a person of heart attack comes to a doctor or a person who comes to a doctor with a small bruise or a cut in his hand the doctor should attend to whom the person who has a heart attack or a person who has a bruise or a small minor cut in the hand but naturally he should attend first to the heart attack because there are high chances he will die for the person who has a small cut he may bleed it may cause little pain but the chance of him dying is very 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 negligible if it's a normal cut so similarly the best is doing both dawa and isla but if your time is restricted and if two are in front of you but naturally speaking to a non muslim and trying to get him closer to islam removing the shirk in his life and getting him closer to allah so that he enters jannah it will take more priority than doing isla to a muslim getting closer to islam but the best is doing both but between the two but natural dawa according to me carries more priority the next question it's come on the facebook again by zedin arik he is a non muslim and he says that if a person is cremated then how will he be questioned about the questions asked in the grave as he does not have a grave that's a very good question and many people are confused that because there is hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that after you die you will be you will be questioned in your grave and there's also mention of the azab the punishment in the grave and it also says that the people who are buried they'll be questioned you have to understand that what this hadith mean when prophet said that after you are buried it means that because today we know that most of the human beings in the world they are buried the christians the muslims majority of the human in the world today if you do a survey they are buried less people are cremated some are given to the vultures it's that they are buried and grave so based on that when the statement is made it, it is mainly meaning after you die you will be questioned if you are buried it's in the grave if not wherever you are that doesn't mean that if you are not buried you will not be questioned there are chances that you can maybe wild animals may kill you and you don't get buried there are chances you will drown does it mean you won't be questioned no because for questioning two things are required the soul and the body the body if you realize even when you are buried it get disintegrated it gets merged into the earth so the main concept is that if allah can resurrect you on the day of judgment why can't he yet whether you have a body or not whether you are buried or whether you have drowned whether you are cremated allah can yet if he wants to give you give you pain want to give you punishment as as allah says that that in the quran in uh, surah insan chapter number 75 verse number 3 that if those people who think that allah cannot resurrect them on the day of judgment so allah tells them he can not only can allah how can allah reassemble our bones on the day of judgment so allah says tell them that allah can not only reassemble the bones he can reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your finger talking about fingerprints allah can even get your fingerprints which is not even identical in a million people so when he can resurrect on the day of judgment why can he do in the grave so it is basically telling you that after you die whether you are in the grave whether you are drowned whether you are cremated there will be a minor question and answer session there will be some some punishment there may be some rewards but the final recompense as allah says in surah imran chapter 3 verse 185 is the final recompense is on the day of judgment hope that answers the question there are many people asking questions there is irfan himayu there is arshad khan and i say walikum salam to them there is sharir mohammad saleh shaukat bin bashir khalidul islam yatu shahir nasib mohammad 
Kausal, Dr. Zakir, I love you. I love you too for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Muhammad Rakibul Hassan, Hamim Riha, Muhammad Naseem Khan, MashaAllah, Shahi Saiful, we feel every moment in our daily activities. Muhammad Rusel, I love you, I love you too. Love to Dr. Zakir Naik, Muhammad Ali, I love all of you and thank you for your duas. We'll take the next question. This question came on WhatsApp. My name is Sultan and I'm from Dubai. My mother has a substantial saving through allowances from her children and occasional gifts. Is it obligatory for her to give zakat considering it's not her income and only her saving? As far as zakat is concerned, zakat every adult Muslim who has a saving of more than any adult, even if it's a non-adult, the adult who is a guardian should give zakat on behalf. Any Muslim who has a saving of more than the nisab level 85 grams of gold for one lunar year, if he or she keeps it, they have to give zakat, irrespective of it is whether from the income, whether it's from the gift, whether it's from the allowance, as long as they keep a saving of more than 85 grams of gold for more than one lunar year, then that individual, male or female, including your mother, she has to give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in zakat. It's compulsory. The next question from Ausain, Tamil Nadu, India. Assalamu alaikum, sir. This question is from a non Muslim who asked me Is Dr. Zakir Naik preaching Islam for money through online social media, etc.? He quoted me a saying from Dr. Zakir Naik that Islam is free. You don't need money to learn Islam. And he's correct. Then why? promote his video cassettes, DVDs for money, etc. He further said that doctor has left his medical profession which gave him earnings and now he is earning more by preaching free Islam. I, I was quiet and I had no answer for this. I request please forward my message Dr. Zakir and I am eager waiting, eagerly waiting for his reply. The basic question is posed by a non-Muslim that Dr. Zakir next said Islam is free and we see that he's promoting his videos on the social media, on YouTube, and he's selling his video, he's, he's getting money. So if Islam is free, then how come he's getting money and he's earning more money? He's earning more by preaching Islam than what you are earning before. And I agree with the person 100%. I am earning more sawab, more blessings for the akhirah by preaching Islam than what I was doing earlier as a medical doctor. I agree with him. But as far as acquiring money is concerned, never in my life, alhamdulillah, I have charged for any of my books or my videos or any of my work or any of my services of Islam. All my lectures that I give are free. The books that our trust prints is given distributed free. There are other people who are printing my books and they are selling and selling Islamic books is not haram. I give them permission. You can copy my book, you can print my book, you can sell them, you can give them free, you can make money, I have got no objection. Anyone prints my book and sells it, it's better than printing books which are haram, printing Islamic book, inshallah you will get sawab. But as far as I am concerned, I never sell any of my books. If you distribute my books, it is absolutely given free. I don't charge for copyrights also, not to a thing. People are willing to offer large amounts for copyrights of my book. I said no, I cannot give you exclusive copyrights for my books. You want, you can print it, let others also print. Same from these, all my social media accounts are absolutely free. Even the Peace TV is free. In the social media account, what happens that other people copy my videos and they give ads which I've, I, don't, I don't object. Many people to get more views, they put photographs of actresses. You know, and I've never spoken about that. I said, and then once I see that, Zakir Naik speaks on Padmavati. I said, what is this Padmavati? When I Google, I come to know it's the latest movie that had come. So they are doing this to attract, which I don't agree it is correct. 
So if they are doing something wrong, they will get the money. But as far as the sawab is concerned, the millions that are watching will come to me. So none of my activities, Islamic activities, ever have I charged for. The only activity that uh, my trust also has ever charged is for the school. That also it is not a profit. We have spent crores of rupees, millions of dollars running the school. It's not profit making at all. And neither do I take any, any remuneration from my trust. I don't take any salary. Even when I go for giving lectures, the clause is there in the lecture that I will pay my own etiquette. I will take care of my own hotel accommodation. Only thing I have to arrange for the visa. That's my condition. But if the host forces me and doesn't allow me to pay for the hotel, I cannot afford. But the ticket always I bear. Unless it is from a government. If I'm the official guest of the head of state, I cannot argue too much. If I'm being called by a king and by the president or prime minister of a country, that is the time I don't insist that I pay for my own ticket. But otherwise, always, even the awards that I've got uh, for the uh, for the King Faisal Award, I got two hundred thousand dollars. That is seven hundred fifty thousand riyal. And even for the Holy Quran Award from Dubai, a million dirham, that is more than two hundred seventy thousand US dollars. All of that I donated for works. So, but let me tell you, if someone takes salary for dawa, it is not haram as long as he does not charge more than his market value. But as far as I am concerned, I don't take because I want, I want more sawa. Because I left my profession and I do not charge for any of my activities. In fact, I spend from my own side. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me. I spend few hours. I used to spend a few hours in business, maybe a couple of days in a month during holidays. And alhamdulillah, I used to make millions of dollars in a year. And majority of my earnings is to go in charity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me more in this world also. Alhamdulillah. If I had done my medical profession, I wouldn't have earned millions of dollars in here. Not at all. I don't think so. But because I'm doing in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the small businesses I do, it gives me, alhamdulillah, a lot of profit. That is the reason I could send, you know, crores of rupees, millions of dollars back to India. It's my hard-earned money. And majority of it, I give to charity. Alhamdulillah. And all the social media platforms, even Peace TV. The Peace TV was started, the company was started from our money, but it was waqf. If I want to commercialize Peace TV, imagine 200 million people watching. And if I say, let the normal charges for a monthly subscription for a channel, is $5. Even if I charge $2, and out of 200 million, even if 2%, suppose, pay. That is 4 million. Multiply by $2. I get $8 million a month. Multiply by 12. Close to $100 million. And the cost is just a small portion of that. But what am I going to do with this money? This money cannot buy me Jannah. Because the moment I start charging, the viewership will come down to 1%. And now 25% of the viewership are non-Muslims on the Peace TV network. If it comes down to one person and no non-Muslim non -Muslim is watching, what will I do with the money? For the money, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that you offer two rakat, sunnah, before the Fajr Salah. And that is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. So if you truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understand Islam, the money, the value of the sahab, is multiple times more than the money. But if you go for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the akhirah, Allah says in the Quran, if you strive for akhirah, Allah will give akhirah and the dunya also. And Allah has given me millions of times much more than what I deserve. Hundreds of million times. I don't deserve the fame, I don't deserve the wealth, the earning. And alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, even if I thank a billion times to Allah for what he has given to me, it would not be sufficient. I will not be scratching even a surface. It will not be a drop in the ocean. The other questions? Uh, there's a question asked by Jamal Abdi Nasir. Assalamu alaikum. 
brother may allah bless you i am watching from edmonton canada and this is the question that came on the facebook just a couple of minutes back my question is how can i achieve the khushu in my prayer i feel my sala lacks enough khushu and there is a similar question that has been asked earlier on the whatsapp i'll inshallah club them together so that we can answer more questions in a shorter time mm. yes this question was asked on the whatsapp some time before maybe a couple of days ago abdus soban from bangladesh currently living in usa my question is could you kindly suggest us some ways or tips to concentrate better in our prayers and gain taqwa fear of allah a similar question is posed by muhammad imran hussein assalamu alaikum sir my name is imran from chittagong bangladesh when i stand in my prayer i remember the worldly things and i keep thinking over and over again about the moments of talking to my friends how can i increase my attention in prayer a similar question again by zerin khandakar assalamu alaikum sir i am from bangladesh many children and adults ask what should we imagine while praying to allah should should it be the kaaba or should we ask them to imagine space and there are many such questions asking mainly on how should we concentrate on salah and this problem of your mind deviating during salah is common don't think it only happens to you it is very common it even happened amongst the sahabas so this is a common phenomena that your mind de deviates when you pray to allah subhanahu wa taala and when you are doing work of allah when you are doing dawa you know you know the shaitan tries and comes and deviates you more and uh, just to make it a light moment you know once once a imam was praying uh salah the maghrib salah and after the imam put the salah over the muttadi says that imam you have prayed only two rakat imam says no no i prayed three rakat so one person gets up and says you have prayed only two rakat and i'm confident about it he says ah because in my maghrib salah i calculate the profits of my business now i wasn't able to complete it that means you have not finished all the three rakat anyway this is just a joke just for light moment so your mind does deviate and though it's a joke it's a reality people do even calculate the profit they even think which business should i deal in should i deal in biscuits or should i deal in cold drinks or should i deal in textile it happens i've given a full lecture on this salah the program towards righteousness salah the programming towards righteousness which is available on the youtube you are most welcome to go and hear the full lecture just in short that when you read your salah i always say that most of the muslims they don't understand arabic as a language so what we should do because we are non arabs our 80% of the muslims they are non arabs so more than 80% of us don't know arabic as a language so i always tell them that at least you should memorize the mean of those portion of the quran that you recite in the salah you should know the meaning of surah fatiha very well bismillah rahman rahim in the name of allah most gracious most merciful alhamdulillah rabbil alamin praise be to allah the lord of the worlds ar rahman ar rahim most gracious most merciful and so on and so forth after that you recite the surahs the surahs that you recite you should, whether it be surah ikhlas whether it be surah nas Surah Falak, whatever surah, see to it that those surahs that you recite in your salah, you should know the meaning very well. Now, when you are reciting the Arabic portion in your mind, because you don't know the meaning, only a small portion of your mind is occupied, maybe five percent. Ninety-five percent of your mind is free, and most of the Muslims, you ask them to recite Surah Fatiha from the middle of their sleep, they will be able to do it. You know, so only a small portion. So the remaining is blank. That's the reason he keeps on wondering. Now, when you recite in Arabic, and when you also, at the same time, translate at the back of your mind 
reside in Arabic, at the back of your mind, the meaning is being translated. Now more portion of your mind is occupied, less chance it will deviate. Those who know Arabic as a language, besides reciting, also concentrate on the meaning and will deviate less. Now once you start doing this, maybe after a few months, it becomes mechanical. You are reciting in Arabic, you know the translation so well, you can say it in the middle of your night, in the middle of your sleep. So what? Then, besides even recollecting the meaning, also concentrate on the meaning. A human being cannot concentrate on two things together. You can concentrate 50-50 person. For example, while driving a car, you are concentrating partly and also talking, no problem. But if you are reading a book, you can read a book and even listen to something else, but your concentration is divided. But if 100% you want to concentrate on reading the book and the meaning, you cannot do 100% reading the book and understanding the meaning and doing something else. No. So similarly, when you are reading the Salah, in your Salah, when you are reciting the Quran, recollect the meaning, concentrate on the meaning. The more you concentrate on the meaning, less will your mind deviate. And less chances these evil thoughts will come less chances you will think of something else. So that's the reason but to concentrate if you know the meaning. If you don't know the meaning, how will you concentrate? This is the most important factor for concentrating and for getting khushu in Salah. And you try this, it will get you wonders. But your concentration level also keeps on differing. The more you concentrate, the more you will, you will get the khushu in Salah. Even for the children, tell them the meaning of Surah Fatiha of Surah Ikhlas. And that time it's not necessary that you have to think of something. Concentration itself occupies your mind. You don't have to see an image. I don't see any image. Yes, if you don't have anything, then you may have to bring an image like Kaaba, etc. But when you're concentrating on the meaning, image is not required and you'll get the real khushu. Hope that answers the question in brief. For more details, you can see my talk on Salah, the programming towards righteousness. We will, there is, a, there is a message on the YouTube just a few minutes back. I just got on my mobile. Muhammad Saskib has mentioned, MD Saskib, Sir, I want to convert to Islam. If you want to convert to Islam, it's a good thing. Alhamdulillah, it is the best thing you can do in your life, you're most welcome. There is, there is, to convert to Islam is very easy. There are main, mainly two basic requirements for anyone to accept Islam. Number one, to believe and bear witness that there is only one Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has got no partners, he has got no associates, and you should worship him, him alone and no one else. You should not do idol worship, etc. Number two, is believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger of Almighty God. If these two things you accept, then you can enter the fold of Islam and then you keep on practicing Islam following the five pillars that we discussed. So I'd like to ask you, brother, that I hope you want to accept Islam out of your free will and I hope that no one is forcing you to accept Islam and it's not a must that you have to do it in public but since you requested me, I will say it in Arabic and you can repeat it. I will say it slowly. And I hope no one is giving you money to accept Islam. You are doing it out of, free, out of your free will. And surely one of the reasons that you accepted Islam may be one of the reasons I mentioned in the answer to my first question. I will say it in Arabic, brother, and you can repeat it. Ashadu Allah Ilaha Illa Allah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. If you have repeated this, mashallah, you are a Muslim and may Allah accept. And may Allah forgive all your past sins, may he convert it into good deed, and may Allah grant you Janitor Firdos. 
I am not used to giving shahada when I cannot hear back the feedback. Maybe the reply is coming on on the social media. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may you get more knowledge of the deen and may you practice more of Islam and inshallah may we be resurrected together on the day of judgment inshallah. Again from the YouTube, Salman Khurshid. I am Salman Khurshid from Kashmir. My question is that it is mentioned for Luqman, last verse, number one can, no, no, no one can predict what is inside the womb of the pregnant woman, but today medical science can. How? So isn't it contradicting with science? The question poses there the verse in the Quran in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, the last verse, verse number 27, that Allah says that only the knowledge of the R is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And only Allah knows when and when it will rain. And what will a person earn? And what is in the womb of the mother? So one of the things that only Allah knows is mentioned in the Quran is what is in the womb of the mother. But unfortunately, some of the translations, especially Urdu translation, they have translated it as only Allah knows what is the sex of the child in the mother's womb, which is not a part of the Quran. It is their own addition. What the Quran says, only Allah knows what is in the womb of the mother. It means only Allah knows whether the child in the mother's womb, will he be a boon for society or will he be a bane for society? Will he go to Jannah or will he go to Jahannam? Will he go to paradise or will he go to hell? Will he be beneficial for the parents or will he not be beneficial? This with all the medical equipments in the world. No doctor can tell you when the child in the mother's womb will he go to heaven or hell will he be beneficial for the ummah or not will it be benefit for the mother or not so this is the real translation that don't we don't know about what is in the womb of the mother talking about the other thing not about the sex that's a mistranslation so that error goes to the translator not to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala next question This question, Assalamu alaikum, Walaikum Assalam, Vimuch from UAE. I reverted to Islam last year in April. Is it necessary to change name in Islam? Second question, I was blessed with a baby boy last year, but I did not do Akika. Is it mandatory? If yes, what shall I do to do a kika from UAE? I need your advice on this. Um, as far as the revert has, is it necessary to change the name? It is not compulsory for a non-Muslim when he accepts Islam to change the name unless the name contains the element of shirk, an element of something which is an associate of, 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 of Almighty God. Like if your name is Ram and many people think Ram is Almighty God. Yeah. So if such elements are there of shirk, then you should change your name. Otherwise, changing your name is not compulsory. But if you change it, it's preferable so that people know you accept Islam. Give a name which has a good meaning yeah. because meaning has a lot of impact on, on, on the human being itself. But changing is not fard. Regarding the second question that is it mandatory to do Akika and you had a boy and you didn't do Akika and if you have to do it, should you do it now? You are living in UAE. There are different opinion as far as whether Akika is mandatory or not. Some of the scholars say it is Fard, but the majority say it is Sunnat Moqada. And I agree that the right ruling is that doing Akika is Sunnat Moqada. It's a very important Sunnah. This practice of Akika slaughtering a sheep in the name of the newborn is a common practice even of Yomul Jahiliya before Islam came to the Arab country. And the hadith in which Ashaba says that before in the days of Jahiliya, we used to slaughter a sheep and smear the blood on the forehead of the child. But after we accepted Islam and came closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now we slaughter a sheep and we clean the head of the newborn baby and we smear the head with saffron. And the Prophet, there are various hadith in which the Prophet recommended to do, do a kika. And the Prophet said that if it's a boy, you have to slaughter two sheep of the same kind. And if it's a daughter, then only one sheep. So if it's a boy, if it's
if it's a son, two sheep of the same kind. If it's a daughter, if it's a female, then only one. And the reasons are there which I have discussed in another part. But doing Akhika, it is Sunnah to do on the seventh day. But if you cannot do and if you do later also it is accepted, do it as soon as possible. Again, it's not a fard, but if you do it is preferable. Even if you want to do it now for your child, you can do it because it's a boy, you have to slaughter two sheep or two goat of a similar kind because it's a boy. Hope that answers the question. This is a question from Wasim Mahmood Surjo, Dhaka, Bangladesh. How can a Muslim woman give dawa, especially if her husband is almost a full time guy? How can a woman do dawa if the husband is a full time guy? It is compulsory that every Muslim, whether man or woman, should do dawah, whether husband or wife or whether the spouse is a dai or not, it is compulsory. It is one of the requirement for any human being to go to Jannah according to Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, was the moment to sit Sard. Now, how can do? I would say that if a woman, her husband is a full-time dai, all the more easier to do for her to do dawah. Similarly, for a husband, if the woman is a full-time dai, for him to do dawah is much more easier. As Allah says in the Quran, in the same verse of fasting in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 187, Hunna le basul lakum wa That you are the garments and they are your garments. If both husband and wife are dais, it is excellent. It's much more easier. And, and while women are doing dawah, you should be careful that you should not break the rules of the sharia. Because many a times, when women do, do, do dawah, when I travel in the foreign western countries, I find that Muslim women are doing dawah, but they are not careful in maintaining the Sharia rules. And I also see that there is a Muslim woman wearing a hijab with a non-Muslim man in a closed cabin and discussing for us together about Islam. This is not accepted. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, if two, if two nahmeram are closed in a room, the third person is a devil. You have to maintain your hijab. You cannot look into a Nameram and a, a man looking into a woman, a Nameram or a woman looking into a man, Nameram into the eyes and then for concentration and, and doing dawah fast together, you have to lower your gaze, you glance, it's okay. You cannot look into, a, your, into the eyes of a Nameram and speak for minutes and hours together. So you have to maintain this hijab. While giving to dawa one to one, it is preferable a man does to a man and a woman does to a woman. Only if a speciality is required, a woman cannot give the answers. And if the man and if the woman goes to a man for seeking the answers, they should be you should you should see to it that there is a mahram. Like if like in our organization, Islamic Research Foundation, when a lady's question couldn't be answered by the lady's wing or by my wife, and if appointment was required, my wife with me or the lady's husband was there or the lady's father was there we maintain the hijab we don't look into the eyes we lower the gaze and speak it's possible but the best is man to man and woman to woman when it is one to one otherwise while writing books of course a man writes a book everyone reads no problem woman writes a book everyone reads no problem at all while giving lecture it is preferable a man gives a lecture there's no problem being a mixed gathering but if a woman is giving a lecture it is preferable that the audience should only be females so that she can maintain a hijab and she can maintain sharia. Regarding how can a woman do dawa, especially if the husband is a full-time dai, the best example is my wife, mashallah, even I would call her almost a full-time dai. I'm a full-time dai and my wife is also almost a full-time dai and I selected marrying my wife was because she was a dai and it's much more easier. Because even if you are a dai, you cannot say I am a dai, that's why I will not give time to my family. A beloved prophet said that the best amongst the believers is the one who is best to his family, especially the wife. Now if you are a full time dai and you are busy, you know, the chances of you giving time is less. So if a wife is a dai, then what do you do? You give time to and discuss that you are doing two in one, when diagram. You are doing the work of spreading the message of Allah, at the same time giving time to your wife. So, if, you are, if your wife wasn't a dai, maybe I would have spent half an hour with my wife in a day, besides the basic thing. But if she's a dai, I can spend more hours. And today I spend 
few hours every day discussing about dawa issues discussing how can we promote islam so it's a venn diagram doing dawa as well as as well as giving time to your wife and when i got married people told me that ah now that you're married your time for dawa will become less and i was worried but because i made a dawa i started giving previous has to give before marriage maybe 8 9 hours a day when i married i started giving 12 hours when i had children we opened a school and give time for school also started giving about 16 hours a day alhamdulillah it's a venn diagram how can women do dawa by various ways they can one of the ways is if they are good with the pen they can write articles on the social media they can write books the literature can be spread it can be read by non muslims male and female no problem she can give lectures especially exclusively to non muslims exclusively to the ladies and my wife to give several lectures in in india when we shifted to malaysia she used to give twice a week lectures and a lot of women used to come if now because of lockdown she started getting you know i'm feeling uneasy you know and now the month of ramadan is come and there's no lecture etc so she started giving online never before she given online she doesn't have any audio of a lecture not that is haram because voice doesn't come in the aura but she wanted to be more careful so for all these years more than 25 years that she has done dawa we have restricted any video recording we have restricted audio recording but now the situation was such that we are going to be locked down for two months and not doing now for two months she could not and she asked me i said no problem all the scholars agree that voice of a woman doesn't come in aura so she started giving online on webinar then i told her why webinar go on the facebook so now when she comes on the facebook there's only an audio live lecture with powerpoint presentation she is not seen in the webinar or on the facebook but a powerpoint there a powerpoint which keeps on changing depending upon what she is speaking so she is not seen because that is preferable because if you have a lady and the close up is there there may be na mehram there may be gents coming it may break the hijab so i am not in favor of women coming on videos and it's a high chances the hijab can be broken so she is doing on audio uh, if they are coming in naqab then no problem but i prefer an audio with a powerpoint and she has started first it was initially only a webinar and there are a few hundred people coming now last time just last sunday she went on the facebook and more than 1200 people saw her not saw her sorry heard her and saw the powerpoint presentation inshallah when time rolls the audience would become bigger the reach would be much more inshallah so dawa can be done in various ways but preferably the women should do dawa to the women and take care of the women problems because a woman can take care of the women problem much more like asking questions on on on, on the on, on the thing of islam about fasting about the women issue a woman will be much more comfortable to ask a woman so in these cases of course and if she is the wife of a dai all the more reason easier they'll understand each other better and many a time when we go i travel a lot i have given lectures in more than 40 countries of the world and my wife has accompanied many times and she has given lectures in more than 20 countries of the world and my children maybe more than 10 countries of the world when we go many a time as a family when i accept invitation they even call my children and my wife so we go to a conference or exclusive lecture organized for me series of lecture i and my son speak to the gent my my son starts give the talk for half an hour 45 minutes then i give a talk for about 1 hour 15 minutes 1 and a half hour followed by question and answer session simultaneously not at the same time but the same day maybe in the morning my lecture is in the evening at a different time there is a separate exclusive gathering of women like when we went to indonesia there were thousands of women 5000 3000 2000 and it was exclusively lady gathering and my and my daughter spoke first then my wife spoke and it was 11 day lecture tour after the lecture tour got over we extended for two days and we had only family time so it's a venn diagram we are serving allah subhanahu wa taala for his commandments doing dawa with the children with the family so of the full family the dai it is nothing better than that that you can pray to allah subhanahu wa taala so i request that all the brothers and sisters see to it that 
if you can make dawah as your full time profession it is the best profession allah says in the quran in surah fusilat chapter number 41 verse number 33 allah says wa man ahsanu qawlan mimman dawa ila allah wa amilu salihan qala innani minal muslimin who is better and speak than one who invites to the way of thy lord works righteously and says that i am a muslim the best profession according to the glorious quran according to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a dai so if everyone in the family is a dai nothing like it if you cannot be a full time dai at least be a part time dai don't be a spare time dai but at least be a part time dai we have from hafizul yasmin ahmed hasan rayan bilaluddin love you for the sake of allah from bangladesh nath arju we have shaheen ahmed asma hussein sadia mehfudul islam sharmin parveen Ariful Islam, Dr. Zoheb Jat, Alex Midora, Yunari Yun, Muhammad Furkan Molla, Prince Wani, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam, Wa Rahmatullah Barakatu, Farid Ahmad, Malik Wurul, Muhammad Alamgir Kabir. I wish all of you Wa Alaikum Assalam. We will take the next question. I am Abdi Nasir, Muhammad from Kenya. I would like to know if one's fast is nullified if one sees sperms on the tip of one's private part without ejaculating it voluntary or by force. Thank you. The question poses that if a person sees semen, on his private part without forcefully doing it or ejaculating is the fast nullified he's talking about nocturnal emission when you sleep and and or it's called as a wet dream nocturnal emission is the most scientific word wet dream if you have a wet dream and there is ejaculation of sperm without doing forcefully or intentionally your fast is not broken your fast is not broken you can get up have a bath do guzzle and you can offer your salah the fast is not broken in wet dream or nocturnal emission. Next question. A smile from Nairobi, Kenya. If a person takes food in his or her mouth unintentionally but do not follow it, does it break the fast? Even if a person takes food intentionally in his mouth and does not follow it, the fast will not break. Let me give you a very good example. When we do wudu, we are taking water intentionally into our mouth, but we are not swallowing it. We are gargling and we are spitting it out. Does your fast break? And the answer is no. So if your fast doesn't break when you take food, uh, water intentionally, similarly if you take food intentionally also, you should not unnecessarily. But if you take and you spit out, it doesn't break. For example, if a woman is cooking in the kitchen and she wants to know whether the salt is correct or not, she can easily take and put it in the tongue because the taste buds on the tongue. You don't have to swallow the food. So if you taste it and spit it out, it doesn't break. Some people take very little, you know, as a precaution. Good, no problem. But even if you take a lot and you put it in the mouth and you spit it out, just like water when you take for voodoo, it doesn't break. If you take even a lot of food, put it in the mouth and spread it out, it will not break. You should not unnecessarily do it. But if you are cooking food, take a little bit, taste it, you will come to know because the taste buds are in the tongue. It is not in your throat. So after tasting, you can spit it out, your fast is not broken and it is permissible. But let me answer something extra. If someone takes food or water unintentionally and follows it, he forgets his fasting, goes to the fridge, pours water in the glass, drinks it, or he doesn't remember his fasting, he takes a sandwich and eats it, does the fast break. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, just mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, hadith number 1933, that if a person unintentionally has food or water, let him continue keeping his fast till the end. And let him consider the food or the water he ate or drank, it is from Allah. That means if by mistake, unintentionally, you have food or water, 
you drink water your fast doesn't break because it's unintentionally and you think that it is from allah a blessing from allah but you cannot do it purposely okay i'm i'm unintentionally having you cannot have unintentionally knowingly that you're fasting so it should be purely out of unintention and if you have even in that condition your fast doesn't break There's a question posed on the Facebook by Abdul Rahman. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Suppose a Muslim doctor does while treating a COVID-19 patient dies. Suppose a Muslim doctor dies. Many a time O becomes I, so it says does. But I realize even I, when I type, I want to type on, it becomes in. I want to drop in, it becomes O. So if suppose a Muslim doctor dies while treating a COVID-19 patient, does he get the reward of a martyr? And I quoted the hadith earlier in my first session as well as the second session that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's a hadith uh, of uh, uh, Sahih Bukhari, uh, volume number 7, hadith number 5734, that, that a plague is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a punishment to the believers, uh, to the unbelievers, to whoever he wants. But as for the believers, the plague is a blessing. And if a believer sin with sincere faith, if he stays in the place where plague is there and he believes that nothing will befall him except what Allah has ordained for him, then he will get the sawab of a martyr. And Ibn Hajar has said this, there are three categories of people here, that if a person who dies in the plague, he yet gets the sawab. If a person gets infected by plague but does not die, yet he gets a sawab of a martyr. And if a person doesn't get infected, yet he believes and has faith in Allah, yet he gets a sawab of a martyr. If he dies in another hadith, he's called as a martyr. But let me differentiate between a plague and COVID-19, coronavirus disease 2019. Plague is an epidemic. So for plague, you get the sawab of a martyr. But for every, epi for every epidemic, you will not get the sawab of a martyr. A plague is an epidemic due to bacteria. It is bacterial. COVID-19 is viral. It's an epidemic, but it's not bacterial. And plus there is another hadith of the Prophet Wasallam that where the Prophet said that the plague will never enter Medina. And another hadith says that the plague and the Dajjal will not enter Makkah. So the plague cannot enter Medina, cannot enter Madi Makkah. And we know today that the government is taking precaution Makkah Medina. So why should they take precaution of, of COVID-19? Do you think Hadith? No, Hadith is Sahih. But COVID-19 is not a plague. So COVID-19 is an epidemic, but not a plague. So the Hadith says, if you die of plague, you are a martyr. If you die in a place where plague is there, even if you don't die, as long as you have sincere faith, you have faith, in, you have faith in Allah, nothing will happen except what Allah wills, then you get the sawab of a martyr, irrespective of you die or you don't die. But COVID-19 is not a plague, so please do not mistake in yourself that every epidemic is a plague. So if a patient dies of COVID-19 or a doctor dies while treating the patient, because he's treating a patient, he's trying to save a human life, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if you save one human being, it's as though you have saved the whole of humanity. So he'll get the reward for saving a human being or saving the whole of humanity. But he will not be called as a martyr. He will not get the sawab of a martyr. Hope that answers the question. The next question is from a sister by the name of Maryam. She's a revert. She's from Birmingham, UK. 
salam from a new Muslim who was a Christian before. My children are six and nine years now. Sometimes they ask to fast, but I don't know if they are ready yet. I don't know if I am ready to let them stay without food for the whole day. Please advise me. Thank you. Fasting is fard only for an adult Muslim who is sane, who is healthy, who is not traveling. But it is not fard for a minor. But if a minor does it, it is preferable they get trained. As similarly for praying salah, it is only fard for a Muslim who is an adult, not for a minor. But there is a hadith of a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hadith which says that encourage your children to pray at the age of seven and at the age of nine if they do not pray you can even use force though fard become when they become adult for a man maybe 13 14 years for a woman depending when she becomes matured at the age of 14 or 13 or 12 but not at the age of nine so the prophet says encourage them encourage them at the age of seven and force them at the age of nine i wouldn't say the same age can be used for the for the children here because fasting is a different thing but surely encourage them at a much younger age before they reach adult so that they get trained as early as possible i remember that the first time i fasted my age was something maybe close to three years and i kept the full ramadan when i, when I was in the second standard at the age of seven my children fasted much more before me my son maybe at the age, age of three and he kept the full ramadan maybe at the age of six my daughter maybe she fasted the first time at the age of two and she kept the full Ramadan maybe at the age of four or five. So encouraging them is very good. Even if a child fasts and breaks in between, there is no sin because they are not fard. Not that they have to compensate after Ramadan, it is a voluntary fast if you break. You don't have to compensate it. So you have to encourage them. You can give them gifts. Okay, if you fast, I will give you some gift, I will give you a toy. I will. I'll get something, some good food for you, or get for you ice cream or chocolates. Good. Encourage them and see to it that they fast the full month as early as possible, depending upon each individual. Not that because I could keep the full fast at the month of seven, nor my son could keep the, at, at the age of seven, I could keep the full Ramadan, I could fast my son at the age of six and my daughter at the age of three or four. Every child cannot do it. So depending upon the capacity of your child, try it out. If they do not complete also, no problem. Oh, mashallah, you at least kept half, no problem. Next time you keep three-fourth, because it's not a fard. Encourage them. Many of the parents are afraid, oh, my son will get sick. Don't worry, nothing is going to happen. You're not going to force them, okay, don't eat. Encourage them. And believe me, it becomes part. And in, in our school, mashallah, people from senior KG first standard used to Many of them used to fast the full Ramadan and all of them at least a few days, Alhamdulillah. And the next question is from Hassan Pathan from Kashmir. Sir, how can we contribute financially for your organization? Is it legal to contribute from India? A similar question was posed by QQ Mrs. Noor from Dubai. Assalamu alaikum. Kindly help. How can I donate to Peace TV? I tried doing it from its website but failed twice. The basic question is that how can they contribute to the organization? Islamic Research Foundation International in UK or can contribute to Peace TV and one of the ways is you can go to our website and once you go to the website of Peace TV the account number is given and you can contribute and I am aware that when you transfer especially after 9-11 it has become more difficult to contribute to Islamic organization and especially if it's outside your country it becomes more difficult so when people try it they are not successful and therefore they are trying to you know prevent all the dawah activities you know those who don't want Islam to spread if you can go to the website it's legal to contribute to the organization you can contribute even to peace tv the thing is there the account is there but those people who really are really wanting to help and you know somehow the other they get in touch with me 
you know, and you know that because of the restrictions that are there from the various, and we as a policy, we always believe that we follow the rule of the country. In India, whatever we accepted was officially in, in our trust account. If we accept in UK, we accept in the official trust account. We believe in following the rules and regulation of the country so that we do not break the law of the country so that we can do dawa freely. But in spite of this following the rules, you know, the enemies of Islam are after us. They're trying to see that the Muslim organization don't get the funding. They're putting pressure on the banks. They're putting pressure on the organization. So in this case, but naturally a businessman who is really rich, he knows the situation because he's a rich businessman. He's a millionaire or a multimillionaire. He's a billionaire. He knows the difficulty because he's doing business. So in this case, is the businessman who really wants to help a die, who really wants to help me, they get in touch with me. And very easy, people know where I am. And once they get in touch with me, they find out which is a very legal way to contribute without causing problem to the enemies of Islam. To contribute in big amounts. And many people call me for lunch and for dinner and for meal and for every meal they give huge amounts and big amounts alhamdulillah so those who really want to contribute they come and meet me when i was in bombay they used to come to bombay when i'm in dubai they used to come to dubai when i was in saudi they used to come in saudi when i'm in malaysia they come to meet me in malaysia they come and meet and we see a amicable way which is legal without getting into problems and yet they want to hide the identity which is good no problem so what we realize that those really people big people who want to support any activity whether it be Dai, whether it be me, whether it be Pishti, whether it be other, they are because they are in the field, they know how to get in touch. They get in touch and they support. They can get in touch with my friends, they can get in touch with me. It's very easy in the age of science and technology today. The whole world is a global village. But for those people who are not so well versed and maybe an average common Muslim wants to contribute, you try it through the website, through the channel, official channel. If you cannot, my advice to you would be, you can always contribute to a dawa organization in your country. If you cannot contribute to Peace TV, you cannot contribute to Islamic, Inter Islamic Research Foundation International. What do you do? You search for the dawa organization in your country, in your city, Google it, do a little bit of research and contribute to them. You will get double sawab. You will get sawab for helping them and getting sawab for helping us also. And your sawab will not be reduced because I told you that. So they will get sawab. The people who you contribute to, they will thank you. They will do du'as, even I will do du'as. The main aim of us is to spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But see to it that the organization is authentic organization, it's a genuine organization, doesn't take time to do research and contribute. Inshallah, I will think the amount has reached me because our main purpose is to spread the message of Islam. If you're contributing to another da'wah organization, indirectly you're contributing to us and we will get the sawab. Hope that's the question. <coughs> Farid Ahmad Jaman Sheikh Sunni Love you beloved Dr. Zakir Naik Sahib I love you too Sadiul Islam Sahidul Islam Thank you Wajullah Best for Dr. Zakir Naik Hilal Ansari, I think, is it the same person I spoke to in the morning? Wa alaikum as -salam. Hassan Habib, thanks. Junaid Halil, Salaamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. Arfan Hiddu, Abidul Hussain, Hafidul Yasmin, S.S. Rayyan, Inayat Arju, Shaheen Muhammad, Mahfuzul Islam, Sharmin Parveen, and all the brothers and sisters, Walaikum Salaam, Ameen for all your duas. We can take maybe one or two questions. The time is short. The next question is from Rizwan from India. Does swallowing one's own saliva break one's fast? Normally, the way you live, normally if you follow the saliva that is secreted from a salivary gland, your fast is not weak. Intentionally, if you keep on accumulating a lot of saliva and then trying to gulp it down, that's makru and that makes your fast. But generally, people are not aware that there are, salivary, there are salivary glands 
in the mouth which keeps on secreting saliva throughout the day on average in a human being half to one and a half liter 500 ml to 1500 ml of saliva is secreted every day on average we fast for 12 hours that means every human being when who's fasting about 250 to 750 ml of saliva is secreted in half a day when you fast and you keep on gulping without knowing when you're sleeping you're secreting you're gulping and some people you know in my school i have to see this to spit i said what is spitting no i'm thinking. so we used to think you know gulping it's not possible that you spit 100 percent of your saliva out it's not possible we get dehydrated so swallowing the normal saliva which is secreted without intention accumulating it doesn't break your fast at all and you can continue fasting it is normal for saliva to be secreted and to be to be followed we are running short of time inshallah we'll take one more question before we end the session this question this question is from sabi kunahir akhi can i give zakat to my own sister who is not so poor but can't lead her life comfortably as far as giving zakat to the relatives it is encouraged only those relatives who you cannot give are your mother and father and the direct ascendants and your daughter and son and the direct descendants these these relatives your direct close relatives your blood relatives you cannot give zakat to you are supposed to take care of them or they are supposed to take care of you you cannot give but to other relatives you can give as long as you can give to your brother you can give to your sister you can give as long as you are not taking care of their basic needs there are many times you know the brother is taking care of the basic need of the sister and then if he says okay you know now i want to give zakat to her that means what he's doing he's giving zakat and he's he's saving his other money so that means you are protecting your wealth now you cannot give zakat and protect your wealth you cannot give zakat to your servant as saying instead of salary i'm giving zakat he may be poor but if he is due to his salary you cannot give your zakat money as salary you can give zakat money as gift yes but yet you have to give your complete salary so if while giving zakat to your sister and if you have been you have, if you have been giving regularly to support her daily activities and then give additional zakat no problem it's good to your immediate to your other relatives if it's for loan then even if you are giving money for protection if you are giving extra for loan zakat yes because one category is those who are gharimun those who are debtors so giving to relative is double sawab one thing is you're fulfilling your obligation of zakat and you're helping your relatives you get double sawab so giving zakat to your relatives is preferable but see to it they are not your mother father and your son and daughter no direct ascendant or descendant you're not taking care of the basic needs and and compensating for that as long as it's not that giving the zakat to relatives is preferable give them support them you'll get true sawab and we've run out of time and i hope that the viewers have uh, enjoyed the session and do pray for me inshallah and just a reminder those whose questions have not been answered inshallah i'll pick up one person whatsapp number and give him or her a call maybe today or tomorrow or day after tomorrow before the next session don't be shocked if you get a call from me until we meet until we meet again on saturday till then assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh